David to stand one more time. Turn to page 244. When I see the blood, when I see the blood. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. so many different things at our church that you can be a part of and one of the simplest things could be is inviting somebody to church right. so March 20th is I love my church Sunday and it's not only just a morning service but it's an evening service so if somebody can't make it out in the morning time see if they can make it out in the evening family friends anybody like that your neighbor go knock on the door say hey come on to church this, this week uh, but it just be a great time for fellowship time because there's going to be some you know, uh, encouragement, some testimony, some, um, you know, award that's probably going to be given out from what I hear. And uh, just just be a part of it, right? There's something very small that you can do. I also want to mention just briefly, I noticed March 27th as well is a spring outreach program. Let's be in prayer for that as well. Um, there's a lot of people who, who needs to be reached, um, even if it's just something as simple as a phone call a letter, or even just passing out some tracts. But as a church, as a church family, that's something that we can do together, uh, you know, in the cause of Christ, right? That we want to reach the lost, right? For us to go, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. So let's go and do that. Let's be in prayer for that. And, uh, and one more thing, uh, don't forget to set your clocks, right? Um, we're springing forward. So if you're a Sunday school goer, which I hope we all are, you know, or, you know, go into regular church service, you know, let's try to make it on time next Sunday. Uh, get get that little extra hour of sleep, go to bed one more hour early that night. So, all right, thank you. Let's go ahead and get ready for our offering now, if we could. Uh, we'll go ahead and take care of that at this time. A um, couple of things real quick. Ushers, if you'll go ahead and come forward, we'll receive that offering at this time. Uh, a couple of things very quickly. Um, let me look here. I mentioned this morning that we're going to uh, 
we're, we're going to be going down on Tuesday and Thursday down to City Baptist Church. And if you're able to go to it, I would encourage you, please let me know tonight. I also would encourage you as a church to get a vision outside of your church. Uh, and I don't mean that in a mean way, but I'm just saying there's more than Galilean Baptist Church happening in the world. Yes. Thank you. Amen. It goes there. Yes, that's exactly right. It's true. It's true. I believe we have the greatest church, but we're not the only church. And uh, we want to be a part of all this stuff. So uh, I did have someone message me today and let me know that uh, they have given to supply. Uh, we're going to buy all these things, but to get, they've given to supply all the refreshments on Thursday evening for the meeting we're going to. Uh, but we do. We could use some help serving those refreshments and that kind of thing. So uh, if you're going, we need to be there by about 6.15 p.m., roughly. So, oh, it's bad. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, we want to we see people saved, right? Uh, if, look, let me just tell you this. If we ever get so focused on Galilean Baptist Church that this is the only church we ever want to build, we don't have a right vision of God. Uh, God is bigger than Galilean Baptist Church. And I'm glad he is. Let me just say that. Because if God was not bigger than Galilean Baptist Church, I'd be really stressed and freaked out about the building right now. But God is bigger than Galilean Baptist Church. So uh, just let me know. I need you to let me know ASAP about these things. Uh, this evening would be great if you could, all right? A um, few things I want you to be praying about, if you would. Pray for City Baptist Church. I was watching their service before I came in here. They started at 5, and they were live streamed. And... Uh, uh, pray for that meeting, those meetings this week. Uh, we are part of that by financial support, but also uh, we want to be part of that this week. So be praying for that church this week, if you would. Uh, also, um, we've mentioned in the past a couple of these, but I want to make sure we mention again tonight. Uh, be praying for Brother Rex Richards. He had surgery on Friday for hernia. He came out of it with no problem. He's recovering at home. Got home around lunchtime or so on Friday. He's doing okay, but be praying for Brother Rex with his recovery. Miss Grace, they may be watching, I don't know, but Miss Grace specifically told me on Friday, pray that he will obey the doctor's orders <laughs> and not overdo it. And I said, well, I'll pray for it, but we'll see, God, God's gonna be, a, be, the, be the one to have to do that. But pray for Brother Rex and Miss Grace. Also pray for Brother Jerry and Miss Lisa Broom, as Brother Jerry is still recovering from all this broken arm and all the things he's going through. So pray for them if you would. And then also I got news just this afternoon, uh, actually this evening, that um, uh, Mary Baker's grandson passed away suddenly uh, at work yesterday. 35 years old, passed away with a heart attack at work. Uh, he has a son that's 11, a daughter that's 9, of course his wife. And uh, they don't know why, other than a heart attack, they don't know for sure what brought that on or what was the what was the thing behind that? But I talked with her a little bit today just for a couple minutes, and um, they're doing okay. She's doing okay, I should say. But I told them that we would pray for her family and for her son's family. Uh, what a sad time that is. So be praying for, for um, her grandson's family tonight, all right? We're praying for the offering also, and let's be faithful in our tithes and offerings and give as the Lord has told us to. Let me just say this. I want to make this abundantly clear. Uh, I had someone mention and say, well, you know, we know why the preacher preached on tithing and giving all month of February. It's because we need money for the roof. If that's what you think, you totally missed every sermon I preached and Brother Rex preached. That is not it. I had someone tell me that this morning. We do this because we are about making disciples. That's why. Do we need money for the roof? Yes. We need a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, if you know somebody's got that, let me know. I'll write them a letter, give them a phone call, text them, go see them, whatever. But well, more than that, more than that, look, if we were meeting out in a tent in a cow pasture, I would still preach on it because it's about being faithful to the Lord right. and being the right kind of Christian. So I want to make sure that's abundantly clear, all right? Let's pray over the offering. And uh, Brother Malin, why don't you lead us in prayer tonight? Hey, Lord, I thank you for a church that we have come to uh, this one. Lord, I do pray, Father, that you bless every one of us here. Thank you, Lord, for, for you dying on the cross for each and every one of us. And, Lord, I just pray, Father, that you, you'd be with the ones that was mentioned about the prayer request. I pray that you'd be with each one of them. Take care of each one of them. Lord, I know you can. And, Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd bless this offering. Use it for your honor and your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
turn to page number, number 29. Page number 29. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make the wretched treasure. How great the pain of sin. Bibles this evening. We'll return to start with to uh, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Just because we read one verse doesn't mean I want you to close your Bible after that. We're going to turn to a few different places tonight. And I want you to see just a theme this evening that uh, we'll see throughout the Bible, not just in the three places we're going to go to, but for sake of time. I'm going to show you three, and that way when you see it other times, it'll hopefully make sense to you, and, and uh, you'll remember this. Genesis chapter 2, we find the creation of man. When we say the creation of man, the Bible tells us that he made, uh, he made man, and he made man male and female. Right. Male and female. And so we're talking about man, we're talking about mankind. Specifically, in this verse, or these verses, uh, in chapter 2, we're looking at Adam being created from the dust of the earth. And then we see Eve being created after that from the rib bone uh, of Adam, made from a rib. Genesis chapter 2 is where we're going to be in just a moment. Let me introduce this thought by saying this. There are a lot of things about God that we can't understand. And I'm okay with that. I hope you're okay with that. Because if I have a God that I can fully comprehend, he's not much of a God. Right. He's, he's like man. And God is not like man. There are a lot of things about God that are beyond our ability to comprehend. Amen. Think about this. God, who is a spirit, according to John chapter 4, is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That's hard for me to comprehend. God is a spirit. And we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. When you think about God being a spirit, and this is very key, I want you to take, keep, keep this in mind, God is a spirit. He is spirit. 
When God breathes, we're going to see that tonight, God's breath has the ability to give or take life. We see in the very beginning of the Bible, God's breath gives life. We see at the very end of the Bible that God's breath takes life. When Jesus comes back at the second coming, not the rapture, but after that, the second coming, and he comes back and he fights the battle of Armageddon, the Bible says that a two-edged sword will proceed out of his mouth and will destroy the beast, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and all the armies that are gathered in the, battle, in the valley of Megiddo at the battle of Armageddon. A two-edged sword will proceed out of his mouth and bloodshed. They're all going to die. And I believe that the Bible, according to the book of Hebrews, is, is, a, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And I believe you have the, the living word of God. That's Jesus. You have the written word of God. That's the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures. And I believe that when God speaks, it'll be the spoken word of God. And just in that breath, in that word, life will be taken. So it can give and it can take life. The breath of God unites and it divides. I want you to notice Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 before we go any further. This is the sixth day of creation. Day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, already done. Animals have been created. Water, air, sun and moon and stars, night, day, uh, all, the, all the things that have been created, dry land. Then you come to verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. A living soul. When God breathed into or God breathed out certain things, I submit to you tonight, I want you to get this, particularly in the New Testament, that I believe many times we'll see that it's an impartation, it's a giving of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you that tonight. When we speak of the breath of God, we're dealing with, within the realm of the Spirit of God. Because you see, when you read in Genesis 2, 7, when it says, and God, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The word here for the breath of life, and also we're going to see it in the New Testament in a couple other places, it's the same word that can be translated the Spirit of God. The Spirit. Jesus talks about that in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. He says that the wind bloweth where it listeth, and he compares that to the Holy Spirit. The wind. It's the same word used. Wind, breath, spirit. The same root word, same derivative is the same word. Wind, breath, and spirit, particularly the spirit of God. When we're talking about the breath of God, we're dealing in the realm of the Holy Spirit of God. Can I just say this? We, um, we use this as a, as a term that I think a lot of people just say it and don't understand what they're saying. When we're talking about the breath of God, this is the kind of breath of God that we need in our church, is the breath of God. In our lives, we need the breath of God. We need, in our jobs, the breath of God. We need God to breathe into it. Because in Genesis 2, 7, when God breathed, it brought life. It brought life. In Ezekiel 37, a mighty wind blew and God sent that wind. And dead bodies stood up fully alive when God blew a wind through that place. We're going to see other places that God breathed. And we're going to see a time when the wind blew. And every time that happens from God, something happens. 
This is the kind of breath that we need to blow through in our services and in our meetings and in our endeavors and all that we do. What we're saying is we need the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us. Amen. Would you agree with that? Amen. Are you awake tonight? Yeah. Psalm 139 verse 14 says, I will praise thee. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Can I tell you that God did not say that about an animal. He said it about mankind. We are not a species of animal. We are different from animals. We are above that. When you see in Genesis 2, 7, when you see the breath of God, you see that the breath of God gave life to mankind, to man. God created all that He created all the world, and He saw that it was good. And after He saw that it was good, He fashioned man from the dust of the ground and gave that man life. It's interesting. We you hear preachers talk about it, they try to make it so eloquent, and they're totally wrong when they say it. They'll say that God, when He when He when He created the world, He took His finger, your finger, and carved out the rivers, and took His hand and He pushed up some dirt and made the mountains. And he pushed it away over here, and the oceans were formed. God didn't do that. God spoke, Amen. and it was done. There's only one time God formed. And there was a personal touch from God, and that was on man and woman, Adam and Eve. It says they breathed into the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He did not do that for the animals. That's why it's sin to commit murder against a human being, but it's okay to go deer hunting. <laughs> or hog hunting, or turkey hunting, or dove hunting, and so on. God gave unique life to man because man became a living soul. Jesus did not die for my German shepherd. I know, broke my daughter's heart. I know. <laughs> Jesus did not die for your dog or your cat. Amen. He died for mankind. Yes. Amen. That's right. Why? Because we are a living soul. Right. We're a living soul. It's different. It's the only time you'll see God directly, himself, directly breathing life into something is in this verse. It's the only time you'll see it. When God breathed, when God breathed, he took just a molded piece of clay and it, he transitioned it into a living soul. That's, who, that's what God did for us. At that moment, the temporal became spiritual. When God breathed, man had life. He gave man life. Go to the New Testament if you would. We're going to stay in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is not deep tonight, but I think that we get so lackadaisical, so routine, we get comfortable. May I say, many people, we get comfortable even in a, in a temporary situation like we're in now, and we get to a routine, and we get going, and we know what's happening, we know what goes on, and we forget that we need a breath of God. We forget that. I think we forget that you can go through your daily living on a job and in other places and we forget that we need the filling and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We, we have task after task after task and unexpected things and phone calls and things that we have to go through and, and all these things that we forget that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in that moment. Let me say this before I read Acts chapter 2. I think we misunderstand the breath of God and, and what it would look like for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid a lot of people, and I know who I'm preaching to and where I'm at in America. I understand it. I grew up in the South. But I think there's great misunderstanding, especially in Southern states, and I'm proud and thankful to God to be a Southerner, okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing anything. Other than there's a great misunderstanding of what it looks like for a Christian to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We think it means doing a hand plant and jumping over chairs and screaming and shouting and spitting and slobbering. And man, they are filled with the Spirit. I went to college with a guy. His name is Abe. 
I won't say where he's from or anything, but he's, he, anyway, he went to a camp meeting and out in a tent, and he was up in the choir loft, and it was full. It was the only place to sit. He was up in the choir area, and the preaching got on, and he said the Holy Spirit told him to run a lap. So he did a hand plant over the rail to run a lap, and when he did, he fell down and broke his ankle in front of everybody on the platform. Say, oh, you're so judgmental. I'm not being judgmental. I told him, I said, so apparently the Holy Spirit didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> it's hard having discernment sometimes. I'm just going to tell you. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but I, it's hard having discernment sometimes and knowing some things like that. I'm telling you, I think we have a misunderstanding. We think it's a success. And I'm not saying that, that we're going to remove emotion from it. I'm not going to say that. I believe those of you who have emotion and don't have a problem expressing that, man, I say, go for it. I admire you for being able to do that. I really do. But just because somebody expresses emotion and runs a lap doesn't mean that they're spirit-filled. Right. Spirit-filled. You know what that looks like? Look right here. I'm going to tell you what it looks like. Real simple. It looks like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. Because the only thing the Holy Spirit will do is to speak of Jesus, never of himself. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Yes. Amen. You'll have the fruit of the Spirit, which honestly is Jesus personified. It looks like Jesus. It bothers me when a person comes into church and they, they, they and I'm, I'm for it, I'm for it, I'm for it. Don't get me wrong, I'm for it. If it's led of the Spirit, the person is genuine, and man, it just gets on them. Man, I don't, I don't care if you're, not much room to run a lap in here. You might have to jump over some chairs. But just don't hurt anybody. Hurt yourself. Go for it. I don't care. Uh, we're not going to pay for your hospital bill. But uh, I'm telling you, these chairs move real easy. So if you jump on, they're going to fall off front of you. Uh, I mean, if you want to stand up and shout and glory and all that, go for it. I'm for it all the way. But just make sure Monday you're shouting the same thing. Yeah. And Spirit of God being filled or filling you. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Let me show you what happened. <laughs> verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Here's 120 people sitting in the upper room. Many people believe it's probably the same upper room where the Last Supper took place. Uh, so there are a number of people that are much smarter than me that speculate that this is probably a room that belonged to uh, John Mark and his family. Barnabas' sister uh, and, and that group, they, many people speculate that it could have been that. I don't know for sure why, but that's what I've read several people mention. And suddenly, verse 2, suddenly means unexpectedly, without notice, it wasn't something they worked up. It was just suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. The breath of God gave power to the church. Gave power to the church. The church, I believe, I believe I can prove this from the Bible, the church began with Jesus Christ and his disciples when he called them to himself. It did not begin in Acts chapter 2, but it was empowered in Acts chapter 2. Here they are praying and waiting on God. And in God's timing, all they were doing was doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. Wait and pray. Wait and pray. And they were waiting on God and praying to God and waiting for the Holy Spirit to come because Acts 1.8 says that when the Holy Spirit would come that they would become witnesses. So they're waiting and praying on God. And as they obeyed, suddenly, without notice, a sound from heaven, they heard it. It sounded like a rushing Mighty wind. I want you to get that in your ear for a minute. What a rushing, mighty wind would sound like. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't say that that's what they felt. That's what they heard. When I think of wind, I think of something you can 
piece of paper blowing in the wind or a flag waving in the wind. It says that they heard it. And that sound, like a, a rushing mighty wind, filled the house where they were sitting. That word mighty wind means to breathe hard or to blow. It was here that the church received power. Can I tell you that with that same rushing mighty wind that would blow through that the sound that they heard, it's the same thing we need today. It's the same thing. And we say, well, that's the book of Acts, and we know that they had to get a good start, 120 people in a small group, so they had to kind of jumpstart the church. I've heard people talk like that. Can I tell you that the same God that empowered them is the same God that lives inside of you and me? It's the same God. We receive the same filling, the same power when you got saved. Let me remind you, you got all of God you'll ever get the moment you got saved. But God should be getting more of us the longer we're saved. The way he does that is by, by us yielding and surrendering our lives to him more and more in a deeper way. I want you to get this. The life-giving breath of God. I believe it's the same kind of light or the same kind of uh, breath, the same kind of wind when the Bible says in Genesis 2-7 that God breathed into the nostrils, breathed into his nostrils and gave him the breath of life. I believe it's that same sound, that same wind, that same, that same blowing in Acts chapter 2 and verse 2 that filled these believers and empowered these believers. It gave power to the church of God. And Christians today have the same access to that same power. Most Christians never access that power. Most of us don't. You see, it was the same Holy Spirit that indwelled them starting in Acts chapter 2. The same one that empowered them in Acts chapter 2 the same one that, that saved all these thousands of people in Acts chapter 2 is the same Holy Spirit that indwells me and indwells you. And every time you have a problem and every time you have a question, every time you're worried, it's the same comforter that Jesus Christ sent to them is in me and is in you and empowers us. I've heard preachers get up and say, well, we need to preach with the power of God. And they never get to the Bible or they quote something and they never get back to it. They just rant and rave and kick the pulpit and throw song books and, and go on. And I don't, hey, I'm not against that as long as they'll stick with the word of God. I'm, I want to be a Bible preacher, not a showman. Yeah. Yeah. All right? right? But I do believe that when the Holy Spirit fills you, not indwells you, stay with me. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you're not going to act like you normally do. You say, I'm just an angry person. You won't be an angry person. I just have these bad thoughts. You won't have those bad thoughts. When you're filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit. Think about this. God fills me and, and, and empowers me on the inside. The way I have that worked out through me is one simple key. It's one simple key. It's all through the Bible. I simply yield myself to him. You say, well, that's not real simple. It's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. I didn't say it was easy. I said it's simple. It's simple. That's key. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3, would you please? Now, those of you who know where I'm going, just because I say 2 Timothy chapter 3, don't jump ahead of me. Stay with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
The breath of God gave life to man. The breath of God gave power to the church. There's so, oh, there's so much I wish I could say about this. I wish I knew how to say it better than what I'm going to say. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. How many of you know this verse? Would you raise your hand? How many at least familiar with the verse? Do you know 2 Timothy 3, 16? Yeah, most of I think it's almost every hand went up. Look at this. I know you know the verse, and I'm not going to go all the way through just because of what we're talking about tonight. I think it would be sufficient to read the first part. All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration. Let's try that again. All Scripture is given by? Inspiration. About half of you got it. It's not given by inspiration. It's given by inspiration of God. There's a difference. The breath of God literally gave existence to the Bible. Literally gave existence to the Bible. The word inspiration, by inspiration of God, literally means God breathed. That's literally what the phrase means, the word means. God breathed these words. The very Words of God uh, that are recorded in our Bible by human penmen were chosen by God. I will remind you of something. You hold in your hand the word of God and the words of God. It is infallible. That means that it's absolutely trustworthy. It's inerrant. It means it has no error or mistakes. It is truth. It is alive. It's our foundation. It's written for the simple, but it confounds the wise. It has everything you need to know. It's life-changing. It has power. It will change you. It will guide you. It will mend you. And it will condemn you. God saves by it. He directs by it. And one day he will judge by it. In your hands, it's useless. <laughs> it is? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, Psalm 119, by taking heed thereto, not by holding it, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. In your hands, it's useless. In your mind, it's persuasive. In your heart, it saves you and motivates you and guides you and protects you and it moves you. Somebody said one time, don't, don't uh, throw it out, wear it out. Don't change it, let it change you. God breathed it into existence. So that's nice to know. No, no, no I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you're getting it. This book. Give me a second. I should know this by heart. Why don't I have this down? Second Peter. Yes, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. We're thinking about the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. God breathed these words. Look at who's involved in writing the Bible. First, or 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, See, I thought man wrote the Bible. Man didn't write the Bible. You hear me? Man did not write this, these words. Right. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake 
as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The same Holy Spirit that was involved in creation, the same power, the same structure, the same organization, the same energy that was put into all of creation is the same that was used to get this Bible to us. Because the Holy Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and the Holy Spirit of God, uh, they, the, these holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Same meaning. Same idea. Creation. Spirit moved. The Word of God. The Spirit moved. And yet we stand in awe of all the mountains and the valleys and the canyons and the rivers and the oceans and the beaches and all the beauty and splendor. And we don't even think about looking into this book. It was given by the very breath of God. The breath of God. When God breathes, it will give life. That book is alive. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God empowered the church and they came alive. You know what Galilean Baptist Church needs? And what I'm saying by that is what each individual member of Galilean Baptist Church needs. We need a breath of God put on us. That's not just a cliche thing to say. It's not just a, oh, you know, it's a, you know, Spirit of God breathe and blow through this place. That's, that, that sounds poetic, but I think we overuse it so much we don't understand that that is literally a real thing. And we're talking about, we're not waiting for the doors to blow open, the, you know, the lights to fall down and, you know, everybody's hair starts blowing and, everything, and it's hard to stand up. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the Spirit of God. See, I thought he's already here. That happens because we yield to him. We acknowledge, Lord, you are here. You tell us what you want us to do. You ever been in one of those services? I know you have. We've had them here many, many times. You're just afraid to make the next move in a service even. Oh, we know what song's coming next. I mean, we wrote it down. We know. Brother Dave was supposed to give announcements. We know that. Usher's uh, supposed to come. I'm going to ask Brother Charlie to pray over the offering. We're going to do But there are some times... We yield ourselves to God to such a degree. God breathes into that service. Now I've sat there before thinking, I don't even want to move. I'm going to mess it up. I don't even know what we're supposed to do next. Do we just sit here and wait? I've been in those services where we just sat and waited on God. See, that's the power we need in our lives, we need it in our families. You know that? Our families, our marriages, my children. I'm raising my daughter and wherever my son. I'm raising these two kids along with my wife. We're teaming up, raising these two kids. We're not raising a boy. We're not raising a girl. We're raising a man. We're raising a woman. It's true. Yeah. You raise a boy and girl, they're going to stay boys and girls. I'm raising a man. I'm raising a woman. I'm not raising kids. I'm raising adults. Yeah. Lord willing, hopefully, you better be one day. <laughs> By God's grace and help. I need the power of God to do that. You understand that? Yes. I want to have a heaven, I want to have a heaven on earth marriage with my wife. In order to have that, we need this kind of breath in our marriage. Lord, send revival. So we'll take a breath of God. Can he do it? Absolutely. Does he want to? Yes. 
then why doesn't he? Be careful with the answer. Because if you know the truth, we're accountable for the truth and we have to do something about it. Otherwise, it's sin. I mean, Brother Rex taught us that, right? A few weeks ago, him to know what to do right and do with it not. To him, it is sin. If God can and God wants to, then why doesn't he? Be careful with the answer. We have that power working in us. Ephesians 3.20 For this power to work through us, we need to yield ourselves to God. If you miss everything else, I want you to get this last phrase that I have in my notes, I've underlined in red, I've highlighted in yellow, and I've made it in bigger font. And a different color font, because I this is it. The more yielding, the more power. The more yielding, the more power. You know, teenagers can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Levi, you can be filled with the Spirit of God. You know that? You can. Just as much as your dad or me or Brother Bill or Brother Terry or we can go on. You can be you can be as filled with the you can be so filled with the Holy Spirit of God just as much as Dr. Talbert Moore was. You can. And I can go through, I'm just picking on Levi because he's right there and I got eyes line of sight right there. <laughs> and I know he can handle it. We can go around the room. We can. The more yielding, the more power. Let me ask you something. I asked our school of the Bible this last semester when we talked about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen real carefully. Don't, I, I know I just did. I closed that. I'm going to give you a minute to settle yourself. But I want everybody to look right here for a minute. I want everybody to look right here. You ready? If you were in Gwinnett School of the Bible last semester, you probably know where I'm going with this. Right now, in this moment, this very moment, are you completely filled with the Holy Spirit? In this moment, right now. I didn't ask, are you indwelled with the Holy Spirit? If you're a Christian, that's automatic. That's different than being filled with the Spirit. Are you completely filled, completely under the control of the Holy Spirit? Every impulse. God shouldn't have to scream to get our attention. Every impulse. Impulse. You know what impulse would be? feeling your pulse on your wrist or on your neck and you feel that light pulsing. Are you obedient to every impulse of the Holy Spirit right now? We should be. We need God to breathe into this place and in our lives. When I breathe, my body operates. When God breathes into a church, this body will function and operate like it never has before. That's good. And you don't have to wait for a revival meeting or a special meeting, a service, or a camp meeting, or a, a, a whatever can happen right now. It needs to happen right now. It should happen right now. Let's bow for prayer if we could. Lord, examine us for a moment. Calm your mind. Calm your body for a minute. Let the Holy Spirit work. one of those sermons, it's, 
It's not hard to give an invitation. It's hard to get people to respond to because we're proud. And let me just be very open with you and frank with you. And I don't mean this mean. Proud people cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because pride means you're full of yourself and there's no room for the Holy Spirit. So that if, if, if there's somebody like that here, I don't know if there is, but if there is somebody like that here, then, you, then the message may not really help you right now until that's taken care of. It's hard. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because it's, it's... I don't want to set you up to fail and be proud. It's hard to do that. I would encourage you right now, if God has dealt with you, there's no doubt he has spoken. God has moved in and breathed into our service tonight. At least he has for me. I hope he has for you. There's a danger of a preacher feeling something that nobody else feels. Sometimes we get hung up on that. We've got to be careful, make sure it's legitimate. If I feel it, then there should be at least two or three other people that feel the Holy Spirit moving in also, at least. Otherwise, it's probably not real. You know, sometimes when he fills you, he convicts you. Sometimes he comforts you. I'm not asking you if you want to get up and scream and jump and shout. I'll be honest, when I just asked a moment ago, are you completely filled with the Holy Spirit? I don't know of one person that really wanted to jump and scream and shout right in that moment. I didn't, I'll tell you that. But I believe that very simple question can open the door for the Holy Spirit to do something. Church, we need God to breathe. And the wind of heaven to blow through this place. We desperately need that. If you understand what I'm talking about and you agree with that and God has shown you that tonight and dealt with you, I encourage you right there at your seat. It's right where you are. Um, let the Lord deal with you and you, you speak with him. But the Lord just now, he just now I believe he gave me a thought. I'm so distracted by it, I can't even go on. We're going to pray. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Remember our Savior's sacrifice for us. It's a special time. After that's over, I'm going to head back to my office immediately after that. Anybody that's sitting in this room right now, men, women, boys, girls, teenagers, children, I don't care. I'm going to call an impromptu small prayer meeting. I wasn't planning on that. Just, just now the Lord's given me that. I don't know how it's going to go. I don't even know if we're going to organize it too much. We're just going to let the Lord work. And we're going to pray. I want, to know, I want you to know you're invited to come back there with me. You don't have to. I understand you have things that got to be done. I understand that. There's no con condemning of that. But I want you to know that I'll be back there. If two of us pray. That's all right. Two of us agree on earth. It'll be done. Our Father which is in heaven. If there's more of us, we'll pack out that office back there. And we'll just pray until the Lord tells us to quit praying. Whether that's three minutes or an hour, I don't know. We're just going to pray. Heavenly Father, 
help me not to make a mistake in this moment. Lord, I tread very carefully. Lord, if the angels in your presence are not worthy to look upon you, they're not even worthy to serve you. The only thing that they can do is cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Lord, I understand that I need to be careful. Lord, I don't want to quench the spirit, vex the spirit, or grieve the spirit. So I tread carefully. Lord, at the same time, I come to you boldly tonight. Lord, would you please send a breeze from heaven into this place. May we not walk out the same as when we came in. Give us new life, revival. Give us a freshness in our spirit. Lord, help us not just have a mental cognitive understanding do a work in our spirit and in our soul that will not be forgotten tonight in Jesus name amen men I want to have you come forward and we'll prepare for this Lord's Supper if you can come forward for that we'll do that this time should have. I apologize for that. We'll do it much like we did last time, just as far as the order and so on. If you remember what we did, that'd be great. I taught in the starting point class this morning, the Baptist churches, and we believe not just Baptist churches, but churches that believe the Word of God. We have two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's not a sacrament. It doesn't earn you favor or merit with God. It's not something that gets you into heaven. It doesn't absolve you or uh, forgive you of your sin. It's simply a time of remembering. It helps us remember his sacri Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us, his suffering, but also it reminds us of his return. It says we're to do this and remembers him until he returns, until he comes. Mm -hmm. And so we're to remember him in all of this. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians 11 that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, that he was betrayed, he took bread at the Last Supper. <laughs>
talk about yielding ourselves and surrendering ourselves to the Lord in our lives. I'm talking about a moment ago. Isn't it interesting that the one who created us, who created man, yielded himself to man, in a sense, to die on the cross. It was by the hands of sinful men that he was nailed to the cross. It was by the hands of sinful men that he was beaten and, and quite honestly tortured, if I can even use that word in a respectful way of our Savior. And that's what this bread represents, his body for us, that he willingly yielded and surrendered and gave up to the hands of sinful men to be abused for us. Let's pray and ask the Lord to Help us remember his broken body. Let's thank him for that at this time. Brother David, if you don't mind, would you thank the Lord Jesus for his broken body? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time in our church service that we can take this moment to remember you, Lord, uh, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, out to, to suffer, Lord, on, on the cross on our behalf. Um, I know he didn't have to do that, Lord. He didn't have to do that, Lord, but he did that anyways because you, you shown your love towards us, even though we were still sinners. God, I pray that, uh, that you help us remember this time, um, uh, your, your broken body, Lord. Um, I know that uh, he was beaten so badly, Lord, and um, that he even lost all of his rights as he was nailed to that cross, Lord, but he did that all for us. I pray that you um, uh, bless us at this time as we do this as a remembrance of you, of his, uh, as his body, Lord. Amen. The Bible says... When he, gave, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. It goes on to say that after the same manner also he took the cup. This is a solemn thing, remembering Jesus died on the cross. I say solemn, and it is sad 
But really, the most horrible day in the world became the greatest day in the world. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Well, I don't know. Was, was it, or was it three days later? Yeah. Let's just say both, right? We remember it all. We remember it all. I believe those three days were even a sacrifice for us. It's an amazing thought. I love the thought that he used something that stains things, blood, to remove a stain. Yeah. Isn't that a great thought? Yeah. Something that stains, he used that to remove my sin stain from my life. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. I normally have one of these men pray over this, and they are more than qualified to do so and able. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Brother Bill, would you mind, however you want to do it, sit down, stand up, I don't care. <coughs> would you mind just praying and thank the Lord Jesus for his shed blood for us? Heavenly Father, we surely love you. And we thank you that you so willingly came to this earth, took on human flesh. Lord, you gave your life for me and for the whole world. And you shed your blood. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we're doing this tonight to, to remember you, Lord, and just for dying for us. And Lord, I love you so much. I just wish I had the words to, to express how I feel in my heart. But Lord, I'm thankful that you can look into my heart and know exactly what I mean. We love you now. We thank you for what this represents. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 The Bible says Jesus told his disciples that this is this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. We should never, we should never observe the Lord's Supper without just thanking him for it. Not for the Lord's Supper, but for his sacrifice for us. Brother Bill, we're going to sing a song. Do you have one? I saw you. Well, I was singing along with Sin was playing. There is a time. Let's do it. No, that's great. Let's just do the first verse. Well, you know the verse, the first verse, and then there's that last, I don't know if it's the last one or fourth one, because there's a jillion of them. About when we get to heaven, when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in a grave. Let's use a songbook for it if we need to. I just want to do that first verse, and whatever that verse is about heaven, let's sing that one too. All right. All right. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners clutch beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. Be here Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, five minutes early if you can, fellowship a little bit. We're going to have a good time in the Word of God on Wednesday night, all right? Let's bow for prayer. Ask God to help us as we go. Brother Tim Foltz. Oh, we got two Brother Tims. we got two people praying at the same time. 
Brother Tim Fultz, why don't you dismiss us in prayer, sir? Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today and hear your word preached. And uh, Lord, just to remind us of the Holy Spirit, how you ministered us, Lord. And I uh, just pray that you will keep these, uh, all these words, all these passages, and everything on our hearts throughout the week. Bring us back Wednesday and bring us back next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.